Welcome to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies, ways to transform our lives for better or worse, are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used, or just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. My guest is uh, William Christopher Winter. He's an American sleep researcher, neurologist, author, and uh, authority regarding sleep and athletic performance. And he goes by Chris, so that's how I'm going to address him. So Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. How are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, I see that you uh, wrote a book called The Sleep Solution, and um, you're, you're huge in the sleep world. So uh, if you can, tell me a little bit about your background. What got you interested in sleep? It's an unusual subject, I would think most people to study. Yeah, I um I got into it when I was an undergraduate in college, just sort of accidentally. I, mean, I, th- I thought I wanted to go into medicine um, and then sort of looking around for some experiences that would kind of relate to that and give me some experience, maybe help me get into medical school. I came across a doctor looking for help with his research, and he was the head of the sleep center at the University of Virginia, and he was doing a bunch of sleep research on pigs and and doing really cool things and, and needed some help. And so I started working with him just to get some some beer money and credit hours and, and never thought it would be a career, but um, really liked him, loved the field. It was exciting. It was relatively new and kind of hadn't been done to death and, and just a million different directions you could go in it, which is fun. I mean, when you meet other sleep doctors, you know, they have really interesting sort of side side hustles when it comes to sleep. You know, this guy might be seeing sleep patients, but he's really interested in, in how sleep will affect astro- astronauts traveling to Mars. And, you know, this woman may be doing, you know, research on, you know, sort of circadian rhythms in, in humans and, and how they're affected by light and positioning where you are in the world. And so it just so many interesting things that, that can kind of come of sleep in a topic that most people like to read about or talk about so it's just a, it's just a perfect field it's so much fun to be a part of it i guess you can make the joke that doctors in your field tend to sleep around but not in the traditional sense <laughs> you know i i did a um a series of articles um for a huffington post called sleeping around where i would sleep in hmm. kind of bizarre places and then write about what that experience of sleeping in an igloo or sleeping on the side of a mountain or sleeping in a haunted house, what that would teach us in general about sleep. So yeah, I I love that, that, that phrase (laughs) sleeping around. That's cool. Great. Well, actually referring to that experience, what did you learn? Any, any highlights from it you can talk about? I mean, I think there's something to be learned from just about any, any, any experience like that. I mean, to me, you know, sleeping on the side of the mountain was really sort of an exercise in fear. You know, mountain climbers, when they make these massive ascents, will get part of the way up a mountain, like a sheer, you know, El Capitan out at Yosemite or something like that. They'll get, you know, part of the way up it. And then they just build this little bed, and, and it's called a portal ledge, right on the side of the mountain. And they'll sit there in the bed and heat up some chicken and noodles in a little freeze dried container and eat it and sleep. And they wake up the next morning and, pack up their little portal edge and continue to climb. So I, I, I looked at that, some pictures of somebody sent me one time, some pictures of those, you know, men and women doing that kind of thing. I thought, God, that must be just terrifying. So I was actually able to find a, a mountain climber who was willing to climb with me. And I've climbed some before, so I'm not, I'm not a novice and fairly fit. So it wasn't, you know, but he agreed to climb with me, get me to a point on the mountain, build the ledge, and then let me sleep in it for the night. So I thought that'd be a great exercise in fear. So the point of the article really wasn't about mountain climbing and this wonderfully generous guy that decided to do it. His name's Arthur. He he, he has a climbing shop out at Seneca Rocks, West Virginia, if you're interested. Um, nicest guy in the world. Um, but the point was really what it's like to sleep in a situation where you're terrified. And the bigger point was insomnia for a lot of people is not so much an inability to sleep. It's really a state of hyper arousal or hyper fear, meaning that, you know, the individual without insomnia approaches their bed at night 
with either excitement or at worst sort of a casual indifference, kind of like the way I approach brushing my teeth. I think it's important. I do it every day. But outside of doing the actual event, I don't give it a whole lot of thought. Yeah, I brushed my teeth today and I did yesterday and I probably will tomorrow. What of it kind of thing. Um, Patients with insomnia have a fear or a sense of hyperarousal as they're moving towards the time that they're going to go to bed. They doubt their ability to sleep. They're resentful that their partner can do it. And they're terrified of what's going to happen if they get in that bed and sleep doesn't happen in the way with the timing that they want to. So I I use the, the analogy of sleeping on the side of the mountain as a way to sort of increase my own hyperarousal or vigilance or fear and and feel what that feels like, you know, in in somebody who's trying to sleep in those circumstances. Yeah, sleep is very psychological, and that's the problem. You know, when you feel like you have to go to sleep or you need to go to sleep or you might not sleep well, it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, Oh, absolutely. You you better believe it. Have you been able to help create strategies for people that have insomnia to help them sleep? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's about the only thing I'm good at. So, I mean, to me it really starts off with understanding sleep and how it works. And and one of the most important things to understand is even if there were people out there who had a goal to not sleep, like that was their mission. I'm I'm going to, I'm going to make decisions in my life that allow me to avoid sleep. And I'm going to do that forever. Um, It can't happen. It's a biological certainty that everybody listening to this podcast not only sleeps, but if you tallied up all their sleep over the last month, it's going to be at least about five to six hours every 24 they're alive. So when you think about it that way, the idea of insomnia, and most people define insomnia simply as, that's a person who can't sleep. That definition is not scientifically valid meaning that, no, an insomnia person, a patient with insomnia is not somebody who cannot sleep. That is theoretically impossible. There are doctors a lot smarter than I am who've looked around for people you know, who don't sleep or sleep very little, and that they don't exist. So what you get is individuals who have insomnia are individuals who, like we said, are hypervigilant and will misperceive their sleep or are not aware of the time they're sleeping, which is, you know, I just had a patient a couple of weeks ago who said, I did not sleep at all during the first nine months of my son's life. And when I said to her, and I always ask questions like, well, when you say you didn't sleep at all, like, what do you mean by that? And her response was very blunt. I mean exactly what I'm saying. I didn't sleep for nine months. It was terrible. And so in her mind, she, that's exactly what happened for three quarters mm. of a year. She didn't sleep. When we know that the world record for sleep deprivation is something like 11 days, and even that was a sham if you talk to the investigator who did it, because every time they would turn around, he, this individual, his name was Randy Gardner, would be asleep on his feet. So they could not, his sleep was like a runaway train. They could not stop him from doing it for little brief periods of time. So it's important to understand that people with insomnia have problems with their sleep, but their problem is not that they can't do it. And when you just reframe the problem in terms of things that are truly scientifically valid, it really makes treatment of the problem a very different experience. You know, unfortunately for like people like Michael Jackson, nobody reframed it. And instead of that, it was this escalating arms race of how, how much drug can we give him, you know, more drugs, more pills, let's have a surgeon come to his house and anesthetize him every night, because they never got outside of the framework of, he keeps telling us he can't sleep. Therefore, we as doctors need to make him sleep. We need to sedate him to the point where he passes out every night. And that was never the problem to begin with. Makes sense. Never, it never is. So what kinds of, um, I've heard there's things like in onset insomnia. And there's another one where you wake up in the early morning. You know, you wake up like two thirds of the way through a normal eight hour sleep and you can't get back to sleep. I mean, right. can you define a couple of flavors of insomnia and what happens? Yeah, so when when people describe insomnia, most people, and I'm not really sure why, although there can be some characteristics that people share who have one or the other, people like to define them based upon where are you having your problem. Uh, You have sleep onset insomnia, which means it's difficult for you to initiate sleep. 
You have sleep maintenance insomnia, which means you can fall asleep or not. But once you fall asleep, you have difficulty staying asleep throughout the night. And then there's sort of early terminations, what we always call it, when somebody has this idea that they set their alarm for 7 o'clock in the morning and they keep waking up at 545 and they're frustrated by it. So it's just basically when during that time period of sleep are you awake and upset about it? Um, and, and, and that's the, so those are the different kinds of you know, characteristics that some people say. You know, there's some thoughts, and you know, these are kind of antiquated thoughts, that the individuals who have difficulty initiating sleep are anxious. The individuals who kind of terminate their sleep early are somewhat depressed. Um, but, you know, those, those are likely just sort of, um, I don't think that you would find that research would sort of flesh those things out particularly well. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've had to tell myself a few times, you know, I've been falling asleep for 43 years. Why would that stop now? And that kind of helps me, but I guess everyone needs different. Right, and I think to, and I think everybody yeah. does that to some extent. So I'm 45 and I sleep well. Um, so I'm not really. I'm thinking about a lot of things today. Um, my son's got a kind of a bigger swim meet. I've got some work I want to do before I go see that. My wife's been feeling kind of ill. So I mean, I've got things on my mind. One of them is not. Okay, well, for 45 years I've slept okay. God, I hope tonight's not the first night that it doesn't happen. So we don't tend to think about things that are going well in our lives, you know. So, and that's a difference between the insomnia patient and the normal sleeper. The insomnia patient, maybe for 45 years, they've struggled with their sleep. They've been, you know, quote unquote, lifelong insomniac. So yeah, they're they're already thinking, oh God, you know, watch a little Stephen Colbert and then. Here we go. Hopefully I can be asleep within two hours tonight. That would be a dream come true, but probably not. You know, So that, that self-talk we give ourselves is very important because when we treat patients with insomnia, we can get them to sleep. That's not a, that's not a big hurdle. What we really want to do is get them sleeping so consistently that they're thinking and they're worried and they're anxious about all these other things in their life, who their president is, what their family's up to, their personal finances – but they're not worried that tonight, Friday night, November 30th, they're going to struggle with their sleep. And that's where the insomnia patient really feels cured when they can look back and say, wow, you know, a year ago I was really struggling to sleep, but it's been a year, it's been two years, it's been five years. I'm pill-free and sleeping well. God, what was going on with me back then? It seems so long ago that I was struggling. That's where people really feel the the biggest benefit to the treatment. So what's... um... You said sleep is a new field that hasn't been done to death. It's kind of weird, you know, since we've, as long as people have been around, they've been <laughs> sleeping. But why, why is there a, are you noticing a resurgence in, in interest in sleep lately? Or, you know, what made you say that? No, I, I think it's because before, number one, the understanding of, of sleep is still relatively primitive, I, I think. I mean, if you ask, get 20 sleep doctors in the room, and I would highly recommend you not get 20 sleep doctors in the room, but should you ever find yourself in a room full of 20 sleep doctors before you run, you might want to ask the question, hey, sleep experts, why do we sleep? And you'll get a lot of very different answers, and, and you'll probably leave that room thinking, wow, they don't really know why we sleep. And, and yeah, I think people have you know good theories of why, but it's still largely abstract. So, you know, it's a relatively new field in the sense that I don't think a lot of people 100 years ago, 50 years ago, were thinking about it. You know, what is the neural basis of sleep? Why do we do it? I think most people just kind of felt it almost like a trait. And you see that a lot in individuals, that the idea that if you're a bad sleeper, somebody could help you become a good one to a lot of people is, hey, you don't like blue eyes? Well, there's doctors out there who can easily change your eyes to green. Like nobody would, really? I had no idea. I thought if you were born with blue eyes, you were kind of locked into that color unless you got colored contacts. I had no idea. Right. I think a lot of people feel that way, that they had no idea that if they woke up a thousand times during the night or if they nodded off every time they went to church and were frustrated by it, that there were people out there who could help with it. They could help with jet lag. They could help with shift work and snoring and falling asleep during the classes that you love in college. Like there is a field out there for that. Um, so to me, I think that's really where it's at. And then just with the whole idea and the last, how much we've learned about the brain and neuroscience in the last 20 years, 
one of my favorite things to do, if you go online, www.pubmed.com, you can search for abstracts you know, over this massive database of medical literature. And it's cool if you type in like insomnia, it'll bring up you know, thousands and thousands of articles that have been written, peer-reviewed about insomnia. But up in the upper right-hand corner, they will have this little bar graph of well, how many insomnia articles were written in 2018? How about 2017, 2016, 2015? And you go all the way back to like the 30s and 40s with these topics and see this, this almost exponential ex- explosion of writing about sleep you know, within the, you know, recent history, which is really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I think that people are interested in it. It's a, it's a publicly interesting topic. I mean, God bless our, our spleen, but I don't see a lot of you know, public desire. We want more spleen research. What is this thing in our body, and how can we can take it out and be relatively okay? You know, there's, there's yeah. you know, Time Magazine's Mystery of the Spleen cover. I've not seen that yet, but if you look at neuroscience, the brain, and sleep, it's hard to find a newsstand that doesn't have some magazine you know, asking questions or you know, putting that on the cover because people are interested. They want to know how we do what we do. Well, I think it's because of the rise of artificial light and screens and distractions and, you know, all kinds of stuff that now our sleep is more impacted than ever. And maybe that's why there's more interest in it than ever. Absolutely. You know, we're asking more of ourselves in in this culture. I look at my children who are sort of older teenagers and what they're expected to do in their high school, the amount of times I'm literally having to threaten threaten them to make them go to sleep, you know. I remember one time my daughter was up so late and I said, you know, wow, you really need to get to bed. You need to organize your time better or whatnot. And she said, Dad, all this stuff I'm working on right now was given to me today to do. There was no such thing. You know, I'm not procrastinating. And she wasn't a procrastinator. You know, so you look at her and like, well, I'm like, well, gosh, then I'm going to call your school and tell them I, <laughs> the sleep specialist, forced you to go to bed and that, you know, your your teachers are not allowed to mark you down for incomplete assignments because I made you go to sleep. And, of course, she freaked out and said, I couldn't do that. But, you know, I felt like it was probably my duty as a parent and as a sleep doctor to tell this high school, look, is it really important that my daughter's up at 3 o'clock in the morning making a poster that shows all the elements of a dash car dashboard for driver's ed, which is one of the things she was doing that night? <laughs> I remember thinking, Wow, you're uh, driving a car and you're making a basically a shoebox diorama of a car interior. Could we not do something different or maybe have a little bit of an expanded deadline on this thing so our kids, you know, ironically, she's going to stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning doing the driver's education poster of the interior of a car, hop in the car the next day, fall asleep at the wheel and hurt herself or somebody else. There's a That's ironically significant stupid. irony there, yeah. So what's... Um... What things do you know about sleep that uh, other people don't know, and what do you find interesting or unusual or fascinating about it? You know, I I, oh, I find a lot of things. So my my sort of specific focus is how sleep affects athletic performance. I'm not terribly interested in athletes um, to some extent. I chose that field because I like the idea of being able to manipulate somebody's sleep and then being able to very easily measure how they perform. So if I deal with a sprinter or a basketball player or a baseball player, there's so many statistics about their performance, it's not hard to figure out if that intervention might be improving things or not. Um, But that doesn't mean I'm not interested in a lawyer or a a person who records podcasts or a school teacher. It's just if I improve the school teacher's sleep, how do I measure his or her improvement or decline in performance versus beyond, hey, I feel better or, hey, I don't. So that's why we really got into athletics. Plus, I thought that if we could improve the sleep of athletes and athletes started talking about how important sleep was to them, as LeBron James just did in the Business Insider article, then they could be the messengers about sleep health that I could never be, no matter how much I tweet and post and write and be on podcasts and TV and things of that nature. So to me, it was sort of too... So the the athletic performance has always fascinated me. I'm also fascinated by media and sleep, you know, the kinds of things that we're doing right now, or a, a writer that writes me and says, 
hey, I've got a deadline today. I need you to tell me why sleep's important. You know, or how much sleep should we get? Oh, you know, and they've got a hundred words they need to cram in between these two other articles about having the best sex of your life and how to get six pack abs. You know, so I love this idea of these little blurbs of sleep that are going out there to the public. Like you need to get eight hours of sleep a night. Well, that's not technically true. What what you're saying is the average person gets eight hours of sleep a night. Well, the person reading that article may not be average. Um, and then there's, you know, in the next article you read or the next uh, thing you see about sleep might say something like, um, it's been shown that individuals who are getting inadequate rest are more susceptible to dementia. So, wow, I really like the juxtaposition of those two articles because now the average consumer of this media is going to say inadequate sleep causes dementia and you need to get eight hours of sleep a night you know, to be healthy, so I need to get eight hours of sleep or else I will get dementia, which, number one, is a miserable way to go to bed at night thinking that if you don't fall asleep right now because you have to get up at 7 o'clock and it's 11 p.m., any time beyond now that you stay awake is adding to your chances of developing dementia. That's that's a truly – it's like going to sleep with a gun pointed at you and the person saying, fall asleep now or I'll shoot you. <laughs> it's very difficult yeah, to yeah, do that. Crazy. So we, we kind of stride – we kind of walk this fence as sleep doctors of making sure people understand – what's at stake if you're not making good choices to, to for in terms of your sleep, but also really providing tools with which people can use to help them fall asleep and identify their sleep problems. So I find that that, mismatch, that kind of mashup in the media is both incredibly helpful and wildly problematic because the media does not do a good job of understanding the difference between a person who says they can't sleep, like an insomnia patient, and a person who truly isn't sleeping. They are working two jobs to make their mortgage payment. And what's really interesting is the idea that if you interview the insomniac who says they haven't slept in nine months since the birth of their son, and you interview the individual who's working two jobs and ask them about their sleep, the insomniac will tell you their sleep is terrible, it's affecting and ruining their health, and they are desperate for solutions. If you talk to the shift worker, the shift worker says, no, no, I'm a great sleeper. I can lie down on a pile of gravel and go right to sleep. So it's really Hmm. interesting what we consider to be good sleeper, bad sleeper. The individual who's the shift worker and working two jobs and only getting about three to five hours of sleep per night because of these two jobs he or she's working in, they're much more at risk for health consequences and bad things happening, even though they feel like because they get in bed and they're asleep before their head hits the pillow, that they're actually good sleepers. That's a real problem that we need to make people understand that, no, 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 you are really putting yourself at risk down the line because this demonstration of excessive sleepiness is not positive. Okay. Um, I got a couple unusual questions I have for you that I just, can never seem oh, to get fun. answered. So I like unusual questions. <laughs> let's see, let's see. Um, so I've read articles that say, oh, cortisol will, you know, will be at its lowest at 4 a.m. and it'll peak at this time, and this hormone does this and that according to a clock, you know. So they'll tell you, all right, uh, you know, you should sleep at these times. What happens if you don't sleep at those times? Like, what happens to someone like for myself? I've been going to bed between three and four in the morning, and I know people gasp for like 20 years. And I get up at 11 or noon. It's just my schedule. What about my hormones? Do you think that they peak and rise and fall at different times? Or it's still exactly the same and I just need to change my hours and I'll feel better? No, I mean, the biggest issue when you start looking at things like that, if somebody's on a consistent schedule of I stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning and I get up at noon, well, I mean, number one, they're getting their eight hours. And number two, it's, it's happening consistently. And if somebody says, look, I feel great. I mean, I, you know, it, it drives my wife crazy or drives my partner crazy, but this feels really good to me. And I'm fortunate enough to have a job where I write and do some broadcasting that can be done at various times of the day. I don't feel any consequence to this. I don't think there's a problem. Your brain desires and really wants consistency. 
That's what it's really looking for. So that sort of boot camp mentality. We get up every day at this time and we have our breakfast at 0700 hours and we go on a 10 mile run with a backpack on our back and then we eat our lunch at 0200 hours. When that day is incredibly consistent and the same every day, our brains really like that because our brain is really trying to figure out a schedule for everything. Not only our sleep, but our eating, our cognitive performance, our physical abilities, hormone release, blood cell uh, production, digestion, all of these things, none of them happen randomly in our brain. So when somebody says to me, look, I like going to bed late and getting up kind of late, that's generally not the problem. The problem is the person says, I like to go to bed late Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I got to be in the office at 6 a.m., so... I go in, you know, really early or this shift working nurse who's flip-flopping between days and nights or we have a, there's a power plant near my clinic that a lot of people work at and the hours there are mind-bogglingly mind-bogglingly confusing. You know, I ask a patient a very simple question, what time do you go to bed, what time do you wake up? You know, 15 minutes later, he's still going through the, the, the ins and outs of their schedule. Now, we only do that for three weeks, then we have an outage, and then we go back to the 7A, 7P for seven days on, seven days off. Like, I've lost interest five years. I mean, uh, suffice to say, you have no idea from day to day when you're going to be awake and when you're going to be asleep, essentially. That is incredibly damaging to the brain. And the World Health Organization considers that sort of altering schedule to be a carcinogen. So it's one of those things that we're going to have to look at as a society over the next few years and try to understand what risk are we putting people in who have these wildly fragmented moving schedules. So to me, if you say, look, my schedule is the same every day has been for 20 years and here it is. I almost don't care what it is because it puts you eons ahead of the people who can't answer that question as succinctly as you did. Okay. Gotcha. Do you, do you have any idea, though, on how the body changes in response to different sleep regimes over time? Has anyone studied that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a whole whole body of work looking at shift workers or people by you know who are put in these artificial sleep situations. They, you know, people who are sleeping on... 30-hour days or eight-hour days, and we've seen research of people who are in space and their days are incredibly short. And yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult thing. There's an intrinsic rhythm in our brain that's a little bit more than 24 hours. So every day we wake up and have our you know, latte outside on the on the porch and we see the sun, our brain kind of resets that to make sure we're, we're even though our brain runs a little fast, we're always about on track. And that's why light exposure and social interaction is so so important. We always keep our brain aligned with our environment. So these things are are studied all the time. So for somebody like you, you know, your brain is going to create certain things, you know, in terms of what what happens in terms of these releases and whatnot on your your own schedule. And it's a one of the things I like studying with athletes is this concept called chronotype. This idea of are you a night person or are you a morning person? I'm a night person. I love being up at night. I love staying up late. Um, I'm not a morning person. My wife's very much the opposite. So what does that mean? Yeah, me How too. does that affect our sleep? You know, is there a right or wrong? Like I live in the South, man. You, you stay up past midnight. You got to whisper that when you're in mixed company. Well, Harold stays up at <laughs> 11 o'clock. You know, it's like, you know, well, that's it's not a sin to do that. It's just I feel so much more creative I've got a lot more energy at that time than I do in the morning. My dad was very similar to that. My mother, not so much. She was a school teacher. I've got a 17-year-old son who gets up at 5, 5.30 every morning. He's a swimmer, but he's always been kind of built to be more morning-oriented. My 20-year-old daughter, much more of a night owl. And there's advantages and disadvantages to, to both things. Um, so understanding those things and knowing that there's not really right or wrong, it's just that is your chronotype conducive to your line of work. I have this little secret belief that our chronotypes actually push us into different kinds of work. If you're a real night owl, you probably don't want to be a kindergarten te- kindergarten teacher. You know what I mean? So you kind of rule that you, out um, pretty quickly. I can tell you a funny story. When I was 16, I got offered a job at a bakery. I didn't know anything. And the, and the guy goes, <laughs> all right, you start at 3. I said, oh, great, 3 p.m. He goes, no, 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 3 a.m. I said, 3 a.m., Why? He goes, you got to make the bread and all that fresh. And I thought, I backtracked. Oh, my God, I have to go to bed at like 8 o'clock. I said, 
well, can't you just make it at night? He goes, never mind. I withdraw the job. You obviously don't understand, but I just That's couldn't believe that people got up that early. You know, I, I think I think he did you a huge favor. Oh yeah, I couldn't have done that job. It'd be terrible. So okay, interesting. Um, in terms of helping people to sleep, what are some of the biggest, you know, I don't know, simplest things they could do, biggest things they could do, most important things they can do to help them sleep better? And, you know, what does better mean? That's a great question. And I ask that all the time of patients. Um, you know, uh, I really have a lot of trouble with it or you know, really been struggling with that. And, and, you know, asking what what is the struggle? What is better? What is your What is your goal here? You know, because to me, the only goal that really should be at the top of the list is how do you feel the next day in terms of sleepiness? So one of the issues a lot of people have with sleep is they are struggling with something in their life that's causing them to be fatigued. They feel run down, no energy. They want to go to the gym, but they cannot literally find it within themselves to get off the couch or out of bed into the car and get to the gym. They feel that bad, almost like they have the flu. Uh, I always think of fatigue like being flu-like. You know, sometimes you have the flu, you're like, oh my gosh, like I really need to go to the bathroom, but is it really worth mm-hmm. getting off the couch to do it? Or should I just go ahead and just use the bathroom here on the couch and deal with it later? Because I'm that, oh, I'm that spent. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm making a joke, but like, but I've felt that way before, like, oh, my gosh, i got to get up and go all the way 20 feet to the bathroom. That's just too much for me to handle right now. So for a lot of people who are dealing with fatigue and the list of things that cause people to be fatigued is a mile long, thyroid problems, tick bites, vitamin D, testosterone imbalances, on and on and on and on, what happens is these individuals wake up and they feel miserable. And their first thought is, oh, if I could just sleep better or just sleep more, I would feel better the next day. Maybe, but probably not, because what you're dealing with is fatigue. You're not dealing with sleepiness. In fact, these individuals will often feel so bad and so fatigued, they go to bed at 7 p.m. at night. And what happens? They come to see me because it takes them two hours to fall asleep. Or they've already seen their primary care doctor, and they're taking trazodone and Ambien and a bunch of other medications to help them fall asleep. Well, tell me your schedule, ma'am. Well, I go to bed at 7 o'clock takes me two, two, three hours to fall asleep, and I'm usually out of bed and doing stuff around 8 o'clock, but I don't work, so if I didn't sleep well, I might even get up as late as noon, and I'll take a two-hour nap during the day. Well, is this really insomnia, or is this an individual who is expecting to sleep 16 hours a day or 12 hours a day, but really only needs or can get seven or eight? And you see that a lot because they've addressed, they've figured out in their mind, if they can just sleep better or sleep more, they would feel better the next day. So like we talked about earlier, they're hopping to bed at 7, thinking I've got to fall asleep now, and if I don't, I'm going to feel miserable the next day. And they don't fall asleep because they're not that sleepy. They're fatigued, but they're not sleepy. So it's taking them two hours to fall asleep. I just saw a guy yesterday who was here because of insomnia. He's taking a couple of medications to help him with his sleep. Doctor was frustrated. Nothing was really working. I said, when do you go to bed? 9 o'clock. How long does it take you on average to fall asleep? Two hours. My first question is always, why have you chosen 9 o'clock as your bedtime? Mm. You didn't really have an answer for that because it seems to me like you've chosen 10 a.m. as lunchtime and you keep going to the restaurant at 10 a.m., but you're not really ordering from the waitress until around noon. Why? Mm, okay. why? Why are you sitting there in that restaurant telling the waitress to go away for two hours? Why don't you just go do some shopping or do some more work and go to the restaurant when you feel hungry? So well, you he know was what? going to bed at really... 9 o'clock or whatever, and then he was waking up at 9.30. I'm like, how much do you well, think you can sleep? You know, so that's not a problem. What's that? Yeah, there's social pressure and there's shaming. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to cry that I'm a victim or anything, but anytime I tell someone my sleep hours, they go, oh my God, that's horrible. And and I know society tells you, like, the early bird gets the worm and, you know, school oh, starts at the time the worm starts. <laughs> so, but a lot of people, I think, just feel, just like if they're overweight, you feel bad. Like society yeah. tells you, you should go to sleep. at media message, you know, like this guy needed to read an article that basically said, look, do you like waking up at 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning? That's what he liked. That's what felt good to him. Yeah, but nobody yeah. ever said, well, if that's the case, you're getting up at 10. Do you realize if you go to bed at 2 a.m. every night, you're getting eight hours? Mm-hmm. So, you know, unfortunately, this guy lived by himself. He was widowed. 
nothing good on TV that he likes anymore. His vision's not great. He can't really read. So I think around 9 o'clock, he's just kind of done. You know, I'm, you know, nobody to talk to, nothing really to watch on TV. It's very sad. So it's fine for him to make the decision to go to bed at 9 o'clock. But this idea that he's got a problem because he can't fall asleep, no, it's not a problem. That's his brain saying, wait a minute, it's 9 o'clock. We just woke up 12 hours ago. We're not ready to sleep again. You know, I get up at, what, 7 o'clock in the morning. I sure as, sure as hell not ready to go to sleep at 7 p.m., not even close. Yeah. Right. You know, so that's not a problem. That's a failure of expectation that for whatever reason, his primary care doctor never asked the question, just kept giving him more pills because what is he saying to his doctor? I can't sleep. Not true. That's not your problem. So let's get into your problem. Let's understand your problem a little bit better. So by the time he walked out the door, yeah, I was like, stay up till 11, 12 o'clock and get up at 930, see what happens. I know exactly what's going to happen. He's going to fall asleep a lot yeah. faster. Take away about, some um, breakfast and lunch. It could be a lot more motivated to eat dinner. You know what I mean? Like it's not. That's true. This is not rocket science. What do, have you ever recommended a polyphasic sleep to people where they, you know, sleep only six no. hours and take a nap, that kind of thing? No. I mean, to me, the only, the only, the only time that that's a positive is if if somebody's saying, "Look, here's my life. I've got to get up and take my kids to school. You know, because nobody else can take them. I got to get them ready because I live by myself." And then I've got a day job, and then I've also got this night job where I'm cleaning offices. What should I do? So in some cases, I would say, look, I think you should get rid of the second job. And they'll laugh at your face and say, well, are you going to help me pay my mortgage, Dr. Winter? And at the point, you say, no, I can't do that. So, okay, now we've got this terrible situation. Let's see how we can make the best of it. But for somebody who's saying, look, I've just, I'm a regular guy or a regular gal, I think it would be great if I slept for two hours, was awake for two hours, slept for two hours, awake for two hours. No, that doesn't help anybody. And these articles that people write about the Uberman polyphasic sleep and how it changed their life, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't happen. In fact, Grant Stoddard is a writer who wrote an article many years ago for Men's Health where, <laughs> where he tried to do the Uberman sleep schedule. It's a, it's a hilarious article where he's He's like, look, you know, all you have to do is sleep four hours every 24 hours, and I'm going to have all this extra time. And so his plan was to learn Spanish and teach himself how to play the guitar. And all. And by like the third or fourth day, he was mentally incapacitated with sleepiness. I mean, it was really funny. Okay. So it's, it's, you know, to me, it's like one of those things where can you take a sleep period and divide it into two? Roger Eric wrote a really interesting book, at Days Close, you know, Journey in the Night or something, where he looked historically at this idea of first and second sleep. Yeah, that's okay. That's fine. What if you divide your sleep into three periods? How about seven periods? Every time you fragment your sleep a little bit more, it becomes less. It's like going to a concert where they keep taking break after break after break. It would frustrate you after a while. And when you look at doctors who've been on call, we got a fair amount of sleep when we were on call, and our call back in the day was brutal. You know, but if you add it up, you had a little chest clock, and every time I collapsed under the call room bed, you started the clock, and every time I hopped up because somebody needed a needle stuck in their neck, you stopped the clock. You would look and say, wow, Chris, you got like four or five hours of sleep last night. Yeah, I did, but because it was so broken up, you feel like a train hit you. Sleep has to be relatively continuous for it to work. So if you're dividing your eight hours into eight one-hour sleep periods scattered throughout 24 hours, you're, you're not doing yourself any favor. Well, what about the people that say a sleep cycle is 90 minutes? Could you divide I mean, sleep into 90 on minutes? A, on average, that's it much. is. That, that's a, on average, that's a true statement. So the people are saying, look, you should be waking up at a 90-minute interval. So if you've got 100 minutes to sleep, or I, I think back, 170 minutes to sleep, you should only be sleeping 90 minutes because you can't make it to your next interval of 180. There are so many flaws in that line of reasoning. Is no know where to begin. Number one, 90 minutes is an average. If you actually read sleep studies for a living, you start looking at these things and seeing, number one, that's a very, very rough estimate, not only between people but within the same person. You know, this guy sure. might have a sleep schedule. It's more like a 110-minute cycle. This person might be even faster, more like 70. So the idea that... You're just born with this perfect 90-minute sleep cycle. is foolish. Number two, the idea that you would try to time your awakening to a 90-minute cycle and sacrifice potentially, what, 80 minutes of sleep just so you can hit it on that 90 minutes, you know, multiply that over a month. That's a lot of lost sleep. 
So to me, consistency is important, absolutely, but get the sleep you can get. And, you know, yes, it's an, it is true that we sleep in 90-minute cycles. How that actually impacts the way you construct your sleep or schedule your sleep, I think, is completely overblown. It's one of those things that's true, true, and unrelated. Yes, 90-minute cycle is the average. False, you should be trying to abruptly stop your sleep at some 90-minute magical interval. And I'm sure there's somebody out there who's blogging somewhere that's changed his or her life, but in general, yep. this is not something that anybody would recommend. Well, when I think about naps, you know, like I've been, I, I never nap. I hate it. I always wake up, like, worse than before. But, I've, you know, I've read a lot of people say, oh, take a 20-minute a, a power nap or a 30-minute power nap. And my thoughts there, it would be interesting to hear what you think, but I think, well, hmm, how do you do that? Because you don't know how long it takes you to fall asleep. What if it takes you 20 minutes to fall asleep, and then you got to get up 10 minutes later? You know, what if it, you fall asleep instantly, and then you sleep sure. for 45 minutes? So how do you even take a nap of a certain duration? Well, the way I always tell people is we focus far too much on unconsciousness when it comes to a nap. So I don't, you know, if you've got children, I don't like for for you to call it nap time or sleep time. I like rest time. Because rest implies, look, you're going to stop playing your video game or doing your homework or messing around with your toys or whatever you're you're doing, and you're going to take time out to quiet your body and quiet your mind. If that results in you falling asleep, great. If it doesn't, it's not wasted time. And a lot of people think that way. You know, they, they take a nap. They go into a little place where they're going to take a nap, and they set their clock for 30 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, and now – once again, the pressure's on. Oh my, it's been five minutes and you haven't fallen asleep. Oh no, this thing's got an alarm in 15 minutes, so even if I fell asleep right this second, I can only get 15 minutes of sleep. Oh no, now yep. it's been 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? You know, what, why bother? This is terrible. This has been a really bad, this was a bad idea. No, dude, the way you, you approach it is you figure out your time. What's your time? 20 minutes, great. 30 minutes, fantastic. You go in there, you set your clock for 30 minutes, or you tell your assistant, hey, please hold my calls. I'm going to go take a 30-minute rest. Tell your kids, okay, everybody go to their bedroom, 30-minute rest, including mommy and daddy or whoever happens to be at home. Nobody's allowed to come out of their bedroom unless they smell smoke or see somebody they don't recognize. You know, And you do whatever you want to do. You can read your book. You can look at your baseball cards. You can play with your dolls. Just no screens, no talking, being noisy, bothering each other. Have, if you want to sleep, great. If you don't, no problem. No pressure. And that goes for you, too. So you go in there, you lie down, you close your eyes, you kick your shoes off, you make the room dark, you assume a horizontal position, and you just relax. Think about your the holidays coming up. Think about your celebrity crush. Think about what you want to do for your partner's anniversary coming up. Or think about nothing. It doesn't matter. Just quiet your mind. Be still for 30 minutes. And if you end up, the alarm clock goes off, and you realize you were out cold because there's drool all over your shirt, great. If you lie there and meditate and rest for 30 minutes and never fall asleep, that's awesome too. Because number one, you know, if you're frustrated that you didn't fall asleep, hey, rejoice. You had a 30-minute perfect opportunity to fall asleep and you didn't fall asleep. What does that tell you? It tells me that you're probably pretty well rested. If I offer somebody, hey, here's a smorgasbord of food right here, and I, and I offer it to everybody in my office, and I watch certain people come in and eat like crazy, and other people don't touch the food, I'm going to assume that the people who didn't touch the food have eaten relatively recently and relatively well, and the people who are eating all the food off the table were people who skipped breakfast that morning. So don't worry if you don't fall asleep. That's actually a really good sign that you're actually pretty pretty well rested. So just enjoy the little 30-minute respite from your work and move on with your day. If you always fall asleep within 30 seconds of lying down to take your nap, probably indicating that you're not getting enough sleep somewhere else in your life. You know, so th there's lots of ways to interpret that. So I just think that having that sort of consistency every day around 1230, I have a little 20 minute break where I lie back and close my eyes. That's a great thing. And then depending upon what your brain is doing with it, you can make a lot of inferences. Again, the insomnia patient will often tell you it's been nine months since I've slept so I always ask the question, uh, do, you ever, do you ever nap? Do you ever fall asleep watching TV or sitting in a movie or in church? Oh, no, no, no. I never fall asleep during the day. In fact, I try to nap every day. I just can't, Dr. Winter. What is that telling you? It's, 
telling you, you can't. I mean, I can fall asleep reading a boring book or watching one of my kids' movies, you know, Cars 3. Hey, Dad, what was your favorite part? Ah, uh, what was your favorite part? Because Daddy slept through that whole movie. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? So the idea that yeah. I try, I've tried to nap every day for seven years and can never fall asleep, well, sounds like you must be getting some sleep somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, right, exactly. So anyway, so it's, 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 there's so much interpretation and lore and misbelief when it comes to sleep that, you know, really educating a person is extremely helpful if that person's kind of coming to the table with a relatively open mind. And one of my favorite things about my book I've read, I never really thought about, but I am fascinated by the reviews of my book, which tend to be either five-star or... Or one star, and when I say one star, yeah, most look, people who look, rate it yeah, one yeah. star wish they could give it zero stars or negative stars. You know, and, and when you read it, I mean, I've got this whole slide presentation on insomnia, kind of more of an academic lecture I give, and I use those one star reviews throughout because it really gives you a great glimpse into the mindset of insomnia, the anger, the angst the fear, the hostility that comes out in these individuals, you know, when they don't really understand what their problem is. It's it's really, it's fascinating and and well-documented within sort of insomnia research. Well, that's funny because I looked at your book and I did see that and the the people that complained were insomniacs and they just, it seemed like they were angry and it felt like you were dismissing that their insomnia is real and it, it was really interesting. You're totally right. Yeah, when you look at what they, you know, the things they say, you know, like you said, they dismiss the insomnia that it's not real or that he seems um, arrogant or, you know, and what happens is, and you see this a lot with insomnia patients, that unfortunately, you know, everybody has to have their thing. You know, as a neurologist, I'm, I'm fascinated by identity and human, the way we kind of think about ourselves. And everybody's got to have their thing. Well, he's got a really good singing voice, and, and she's a fantastic hunter, or she's a really good student and makes straight A's, and he makes a lot of money. Like, and when you don't have your thing, sometimes bad things can become your thing. And for a lot of individuals with insomnia, they're struggling in a lot of aspects in their life. Their thing that they kind of hold on to that makes them unique is, I can't sleep. Nobody can figure it out. You know, I've been to 30 different sleep specialists and tried 17 different sleeping pills, and I still can't sleep. And so when you start to write about insomnia as not being somebody who can't sleep, in fact, most insomnia patients sleep more than normal matched individuals, it is literally attacking their identity. You know what? Your mom and dad, <laughs> they're not who you think they are. That If somebody came up to me off the street, a stranger, and said, your brother, your sister, and your mom and dad, they're not your mom and dad. I know it. Goodbye. Mm. <laughs> well, it would be jarring, and I might be pretty upset. Oh, who are you? You don't know who I am. You don't, you don't know me. There's, so there's this sort of a hostility that's the biggest obstacle to these individuals finding solutions to their treatment. I mean, I've had patients walk out of our clinic when I don't go back into the vault and bring out the super secret sleeping pills. You know, what yeah. do you mean you're not going to give me pills? What do you mean pills aren't the way I have to yeah. have these pills or I won't be able to sleep? Well, that will show me a paper that, that has ever shown somebody who needs something medicinal to sleep. No, if we sit in these chairs long enough and talk or on this podcast long enough, we'll both fall asleep <laughs> as will every listener. That is, that is scientifically guaranteed as much as the sun will come up tomorrow. So it, it, these true. thoughts can be very <laughs> jarring, and I like the idea – that that person took the time to write that one-star review because while I might be the bad guy and I might be throwing that book in the trash can, I've mm -hmm. gotten through to them. Like I've resonated enough in their mind. I've planted a seed in their mind that maybe they'll go talk to another sleep doctor and say, hey, there's this quack guy. One of my favorite was somebody wrote this, this so-called, quote, sleep doctor. That's like the only right. thing I am. So it's pretty funny that the so called <laughs> basketball player, so called monopoly expert, you know, maybe, maybe not, but it was pretty they put that in quotations. But, you know, maybe they'll go to their doctor and say, I read this terrible book of this arrogant jackass named Dr. Winter, and he said my insomnia isn't that I don't sleep, it's that I don't perceive sleep and I'm hypervigilant. And maybe that doctor will say, Yeah, he's right. And maybe that will start a dialogue that will eventually get that person the help they need. So I, I don't mind being bad cop. I don't mind what, whatsoever. 
Well, that's really cool how you, how you take the feedback and make it into good things and use it. That's great. That's so good for you. Yeah, no, it, it, I mean, it, it, it tells me you got to break a few eggs sometimes to make an omelet. And a couple of doctors told yeah. me that, you know, these very influential mentors in my life that we're not there to tell patients what they want to hear. You know, we're there you to educate really, really them really and bad really joke. be an ally. What's that? You have to you have to offend a few patients to make it in somewhat. That's a horrible joke, but and just gave them that. Yeah, and you know, I think what people perceive is is not treating it seriously, is me trying to sort of be the antidote to the book. You know, Matt Walker wrote a fantastic book, While We Sleep. I can guarantee you that he is responsible for a lot of patients that come to my clinic with insomnia because you read it and everything in it's true. You know, the links between mm. dementia, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity, death, 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 you know, everything in there is true. Um, but it's presented in a way that's very heavy and scary and probably mm. not going to help somebody who's struggling with their sleep help them sleep. That's not what his, jo- his book's about. You know, so to me the point of making some jokes in the book is that, look, you're having trouble with your sleep, but you're 62 years old and you look great and you don't have, you don't take any medications besides these seven drugs you take to help you sleep at night. Like you're in good shape. You're healthy. Mm. Despite the fact you've had 30 years of bad sleep. It's like one of my mentors told me all the time, insomnia is the worst condition in the world that hurts nobody which is a really interesting way to put it. So if we can kind of make light of it and, and, and sort of de, de-escalate the situation, everybody take a deep breath, you're fine, you've got some insomnia, we're going to fix it, that that individual who comes to the table that way, a little bit more, you know, talk them down a little bit, and let's open their mind up and fill their minds with some good news and some funny anecdotes and some thoughts, we're going to have a lot more success with that person over time. Okay. Well, this has been great. You know, so like you said, we don't want to put people to sleep and we can't go forever. And uh, I really appreciate your time. Hey, my pleasure. uh, Yeah. What's some resources for people? You mentioned a few as we talked, but, you know, someone needs help with their sleep. They feel like, I don't know if you can help everybody. You probably can't. But what are resources for listeners? Well, I mean, that's why I wrote the book is because I can't help everybody, but I sure as hell like to be able to. So I always tell people the book's called The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep's Broken and How to Fix It. It's either the worst sleep book in the world, in which case you'll read it. It'll be so deadly boring that you'll fall asleep. Or it is the best yeah. sleep book, in which case um, you'll you get something out of it and it'll really help you sleep. So that the book's available online, Kindle and you know audio on Audible or you know paperback, hardback, whatever. Um, my Twitter is at sportsleepdoc.com. Um, so if you follow me on Twitter, I try to just post things that are really good that might help somebody with their sleep. And then our website is um, C- cvillenuroandsleep.com, um, and it's got a whole bunch of references as well, too. Well, very good. Well, Chris, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your wisdom hey, and your time. Hey, my pleasure. Anytime. I hope, I hope it's been helpful to your listeners. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, both to review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.